Hi everyone, uh, my name is Al Clark. Welcome to Blackboard Sessions number four. Uh, today's topic will be uh, primarily an upsampling and when it makes sense, perhaps when it doesn't, and also a little bit on uh, oversampling. So I thought we'd start with getting a few terms out of the way and make sure that everybody understands when I talk about upsampling or oversampling, how that's different. And before we do that very much, I, we're going to talk about a couple of really basic things. So we're going to make some assumptions. The first assumption is that audio is primarily from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Now, I realize that we have some discussions about maybe things above 20 kilohertz are important. Um, and that may be true. But I think what everybody agrees about is what happens from 20 kilohertz and below is very important. So that's going to be the most of the context we'll talk about today. Um, and that's important because knowing that has a lot of context of why we might upsample or oversample in the first place. So what is this upsampling, oversampling stuff mean? Well, if I've got a signal coming in, and I'm going to just draw one here. This is just a sine wave, and it continues, of course. And I'm going to assume this one's 20 kilohertz because it illustrates my point well. So if I'm oversampling, well, no, if I'm sampling, let's just start with sampling, then I might take a measurement, say, from here to here, and another one perhaps from about here to here, and about here to here. And this is going to create a number. Um, if I'm sampling exactly 40 kilohertz, then I would have essentially two of these for every one of these cycles for a 20 kilohertz wave. Um, and there's some rules in signal processing that are really important, and that is that I have to have at least two samples, and if I have at least two samples, um, I can describe this wave. Um, but there's a, a bit of a gotcha. Okay? So what's the gotcha? Well, if I cheat this rule a little bit, let's say this wave was instead 21 kilohertz, um, then I can't really tell if that's 21 kilohertz or 19 kilohertz. And that phenomenon is called aliasing. Now you've heard of aliasing or seen aliasing at least on, on movies and television because you've seen say a car ad where the, uh, the wheels are going backwards on the car and you know pretty much that the car is not in reverse so it's something magic must be happening and this is a case where the camera is taking pictures a la sampling and it's not quite fast enough and so all of a sudden it's getting to a spot where it's actually aliasing so bad that it stops and then goes in reverse. And you see that visually. Well, the same thing happens here. This is a far more subtle version of, of perhaps a 21 kilohertz and 19. Um, but you wouldn't want to hear 21 kilohertz indistinguishable as 19. Why? Well, because the harmonics of 21 and 19 are not very closely related. And so I think your chimes would start to sound pretty nasty. Um, so, but that's, that's, that's the beginning spot of it. So oversampling says, oh, I have this wave. What if I look at it more often? So I have my analog signal coming in and I look at it more often. Say here and here and here. And maybe that's 40 killer sampling in my example. Or I said 40 killer sampling, 80 killer sampling. So that now this, this alias thing I just talked about doesn't happen around 20K, it would have happened around 40K. So 41 would have looked like 39. Well, if I had 41 kilohertz or 39 kilohertz and I'm not a bat, that may not be tremendously audible. And I might live with that. Let's talk about content as we get it today. So most content that we have today uh, probably derived from a CD. So it's 41.1 kilohertz. Notice that I said 40 before, but we're going to call it now 44.1 kilohertz. Because I want to have a little bit of room. So why do I care? Well, if I said I, I need to make 20 kilohertz really good, but I don't want this stuff higher than 20 kilohertz, I put, before my A to D converter seeds, I build something called an anti-aliasing filter. 
And if it's sampling at 44 kilohertz, I need to really attenuate this because at 22.05 kilohertz, this is called the folding frequency, things on this side of the curve, if that was the spot right here in my spectrum, for example, things on this side of the line are going to look just, are going to fold over this imaginary line. So 23.05 would look the same as 21 point, um, whatever that is. You know, I, why I picked 40 kilohertz the first time. So we build this filter and we say, okay, if I can't tell the difference, then how do I keep it from being a problem? Well, I use this thing called an anti-icing filter. And if, it's, if I've got to make this go, go, basically, I want this to be perfect to 20 kilohertz. And I want this to be essentially gone at, at not very much north of that. So that this folding frequency, as it starts getting closer to 20, there's nothing there. I've filtered it all out. I've, it's basically, if it's not there, it can't alias. That's the idea. So, so the, the catch is that building, a, this is, in this case, this is normally called a brick wall filter. And, it's, and brick wall filters are difficult to design. They almost always are going to get in the way because a perfect brick wall filter would be infinitely complex and would take an infinity to actually calculate in time. So a real life filter is going to have some, it's going to look something like this. And it's hard to design, even if you're really good at it. And it's very hard to construct. But it, you can do it to a certain amount, you know, you can do it okay, but you can't do it great. So why would, how did we get here? Well, we got here this way. Back in the day, when we first started looking at CDs, memory and, and CD, you know, the optical technology was, was tricky. It was hard. And the, more, the higher the sample rate, the more bits it's going to take for the same amount of time. The more bit depth, which we haven't talked about yet, the 16 bits, for instance, the more bits, the more bits it takes on the CD. So if we want to put an album on this little piece of media, we had to figure out how we're going to squeeze it all in. You might notice that typically DVDs are a higher sample rate for the audio because we got better at doing optical media. So given they picked 44, 1, and 16 bits as our starting spot, we had, that's where we started with. And so oversampling would say, we're not constrained by this, just, just record at a higher level and maybe we'll put it in, on a format like a FLAC format or something and reproduce it. That's what oversampling is. So we're going to talk about the next thing and we're going to talk about upsampling in a moment. We're almost there, promise. So the first thing I want to talk about when we talk about changing sample rates to higher rates using this idea of upsampling is I want to keep one thing really in mind. If I've got a CD and it's 44.1 kilohertz and it's 16 bits, no matter how clever I think I am and how, good, how much math I throw at this and how fast my processing power is, the quality is limited to 44.1 sample rates and 16 bits. You can't make it better than that. Now, you can technically make it worse, but you can't make it better from that intrinsically. It doesn't happen. Um, so you can't really dumb it down. If you start off with crappy wine, it's not going to turn to Rothschild because you boiled it or something. Uh, but you can take Rothschild and add you know, a teaspoon of sewage in it and it's sewage. So why is that important? Well, upsampling works differently. Oversampling, we were taking samples with an A to D while it's still analog. In upsampling, we have this, I'm going to draw this picture again, but I'm going to draw it a little different. And here's my first point, and here's my second one, and so forth, okay? So imagine that, that I, I magically stick points between them. And I do this with a process that's called zero padding. So this is a number. Maybe it's written as, you know, 01001 something or another. 16 bits of it to CD. And actually this is probably, and then the next one, let's say up here was 01. 0, 1, 1, something. It doesn't really matter. There's numbers. Okay? So I take the, I, I fictitiously place some points between them. This is called zero padding, and their value is zero. So what we have is now is a number, zero, 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 a negative number in this case, zero, 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 positive number, and so forth. And that's what I'm starting with. So the, all I have to work with, frankly, are these these particular samples here, here, and here. 
So using a, uh, a fast computer chip like your music server is likely to have, uh, maybe it's a, your computer, an Intel processor, or of course if it's a DSP, well that's what DSPs do for a living is signal processing. Then what we're going to do is we're going to use a digital filter. Oftentimes it's going to be done through, it's, it's called an interpolation filter. And there's no special rule that it had to be three samples between. It could be some arbitrary number. And we're going to fill in these gaps. And it's going to pretend that it fills in something like this. In, in other words, these points that were zero, it's going to make them numbers. But these numbers are kind of just contrived. They're not actually, they're only based on the fact that we had these endpoints. And that process is called upsampling. And we're going to do some filtering to make that all magic happen. But that's all done in the digital domain. It's not done as an analog filter. And when we've done that, in my case of the three, I've just multiplied the effective sample rate by a factor of four. So now the sample rate, if it was 44.1, would have been 176.4. But it could have been, say, 192, because I picked four, but I could have picked a different ratio, and it doesn't have to be an integer ratio. Uh, it just makes the filtering a little bit more complex for the, the person writing the code, but intrinsically there's no advantage or disadvantage to upsampling by two or four versus, you know, four point something and change. You know, the ratio of 192 to 176.4, which is kind of an ugly number. Um, but it's, it's not a problem. So, so that's what upsampling actually is. Now, the, so now, why would you care? Why would you do it? Well, if somebody has decided to sell you upsampled content, you know, for more money from a, a service, let's say, um, then I would say they're just taking your money um, because it hasn't made your content any better. It's no different. And if it started out as 44, 1, and 16, that's the limitation of the content. You can, you know, if it's aliased, if it's got problems, whatever, you're stuck. It's as good as it's ever going to get. Upsampling didn't make it better. It might have made it more expensive at that stage. Now, you can certainly upsample with your music server, and you can upsample, uh, and for instance, our DSP products. We do it routinely uh, as a matter of practice. So why would you upsample? Well, a couple of reasons. First of all, even though you might not listen, you know, we've said maybe you don't hear a lot about 20 kilohertz, we'd like all the bad things to happen far away from 20 kilohertz. So one of the advantages of upsampling at some point is instead of having this brick wall filter that had a response looking like this, because the aliasing stuff starts happening around here, is that we could, if the bad stuff happened, say, way up here, we could have a filter that was more like this. And that filter is a whole lot easier than the, than the brick wall one. And, you don't, and this has been known for a long, long time. So one of the first things we want to do uh, from, is we want to take this problem of reproduction away. Uh, in a DAC, it's called an anti reconstruction filter or perhaps an anti-imaging filter. It's just two ways of talking about the same thing. So, so one reason we'd upsample was just to do that. And so even though maybe you don't hear 40 kilohertz or 38 kilohertz because you're not a bat, um, and you certainly don't want your equipment to hear it, and you certainly don't want aliasing to get into that 20 kilohertz band that we all agree is important. So that's one reason we might consider upsampling. And so that's, that's an important area. Now, as you all probably know, Danville are big advocates of DSP active filters. And if I'm doing a DSP active filter, the content comes in at some sample rate. Let's say we have choices. Maybe there's a 44.1 here. Maybe there's a 48 coming from Bluetooth, which may not be nearly as good as that. Um, 96 might be from a, a DVD. 48 might be your television from HDMI. It doesn't really matter. It comes, they're not necessarily the same as what I'm really trying to say. So they're all coming in here. And I'd still like to do a bunch of filtering because I want to do band splitting, I want to do equalization, I want to do time alignment. All these clever things that you can do with a DSP active filter. So we're not done with the signal yet because we would like to, before we put these to a DAC, we'd like to do this signal processing stuff. 
So one of the first things that, I, that we want to do, or we, it is a benefit of doing, is if I upsample this, that's what this arrow going up means, uh, using DSP magic in this case, uh, then I might transfer this all to be 192. And notice that 44.1 to 192 is just fine. There's no real issue with that. Um, and if it's all the same sample rate, that means that all the filtering I might do. For instance, maybe I've got uh, a crossover here, a band splitter. Maybe this is a uh, link with Riley or some other kind of filter. It doesn't make any difference. And I've got stuff going to the tweeter chain up here with some, maybe some more filtering. And I've got uh, stuff going to, say, a woofer with some more filtering and some time alignment over here, maybe, and so forth. That it's really convenient for me to have one sample rate because if I didn't, I'd have to have a different crossover for every sample rate that was going into my system instead of one unified one. So why should I tune up and work all over so hard as, my, as a speaker designer to make all this stuff work really well and then say, okay, now I gotta do it for the next sample rate and start over and so forth. So having one steady one is really helpful. Um, the other advantage to upsampling is there's some clever ways of doing this upsampling and it's called an ASRC, asynchronous sample rate converter. And what that does is that even if this frequency is the same or almost the same, and this is really more correct, if this is 192, it's not really 192, it's 192 plus or minus a little bit. And, and so we can take one that's almost the same to here, and when we do that, we can get jitter attenuation. And jitter is, a, uh, for another discussion later, uh, but this is a really good way of getting rid of jitter in our system. In fact, it's the best way of getting rid of jitter in our system. And we will talk about that in a future, future session. So thank you, and, and we hope this has clarified some of these things.